Here we have a cross section of a circular track with an embankment. The embankment is at an angle of theta degrees to the horizontal. Here we have a snapshot of the car at a particular instant of its motion. Let's indicate the forces on the car. Now we have its weight. Now I'm going to put the tail of the weight vector here just to make the picture easier to read. So the mass is m, the weight is mg. Now the ground is pressing on the car. So there's a contact force between the ground and the car in a direction perpendicular to the surface of contact. So I'll call this force n. Now let's suppose that the speed of the car is v and it's maintaining that uniform speed. So it's moving into the screen if this is the back of the car. Now we saw in the last video that for a car to maintain a circular path, it's got to apply a force to the ground. So when the wheels are turned, the wheels push on the ground in this direction. So this is the force on the ground, not on the car. But by Newton's third law, the ground pushes with an equal and opposite force on the car. We called this force FCG, force on the car due to the ground. We also saw in the last video that the magnitude of this force varies from a minimum value of zero, if the car is not pushing on the ground, to a maximum of mu times n. This maximum value is called a limiting friction. Mu depends on the surfaces that are in contact, so it depends in, on the material of the tires and the ground that the tires are moving on. We saw that um, both surfaces mu mu must be rough to a certain degree. If one su surface is perfectly smooth, either the wheels or the ground, then mu is going to equal zero. And in that situation, the car cannot exert a force on the ground, which means the ground cannot exert a force on the car. So the car cannot move in a, a circular path. Actually, the car cannot move at all if it's starting from rest, because if mu is zero, the tire cannot push on the ground, even if the car wants to move forward. Suppose the car wants to move forward and the tire spin in this direction. It needs to push back on the ground. It needs to exert a force on the ground. By Newton's third law, the ground exerts an equal and opposite force on the car to push it forward. But if, if either the wheel or the ground is perfectly smooth, then the wheel cannot push back on the ground. So the wheel will just keep spinning in ra around and around. And won't, the car won't move forward. Now, let's suppose that the maximum friction force is acting on the car. So the ground is pushing on the car, uh, um, you know, with the highest possible value, which is mu times n. So I'll change this to mu n. Now the car is not in equilibrium. It's not sitting here at rest. If it was, these three vectors would sum to zero. Since the car is moving with speed v in a circle of radius r, we know that uh, the resultant force on the car points towards the center of the circle. So again, we are assuming that the car is moving with constant or uniform speed in this circle. Now here I'm trying to show the resultant force. Well, more realistically, its magnitude should be a bit greater actually, uh, because its magnitude comes from the horizontal components of these two forces. We know that the magnitude of the resultant force is mv squared over r. Now let's look at the vertical components of the three forces acting on the car. Okay, well, um, the, the vertical component of mg is just mg itself. It is no horizontal component. What about the vertical component of vector mu n? Well, this angle here is theta, the same as this angle here. So if we multiply mu n by sine of theta, we will get the vertical component of mu n. So these are these vertical components are both downward. They're pointing in the same direction. Um, so if we add these together, we get the sum of the downward vertical components. And now let's take the upward vertical components. Well, the only force that has an upward vertical component is n. So here it is. What's this angle in here? If we know this angle, we can multiply n by the cos of this angle. Well, it's actually theta. And why is that? Because theta 
is an angle between the embankment and the horizontal. And these two vectors, n and its com vertical component, are perpendicular to this pair of lines, the embankment and the horizontal. So n itself is perpendicular to the embankment, and this vertical line here is perpendicular to the horizontal. So the angle between th this pair of lines is the same as the angle between this pair of lines. So the vertical component of n is n cos theta. Now we know that the resultant force of, um, or sorry, the vertical component of the resultant force is zero. Okay, it's entirely, f is entirely in the horizontal direction. So this is vector f, I've just written down its magnitude here. So since its vertical component is zero, it means that um, this thing here, sum of the downwards vertical components, must equal the upward vertical components. So equating these and making n the subject, we get n equals mg over cos theta minus mu sine theta. Now let's get the horizontal components of the three force vectors. Well, mg is vertically down, so it has no horizontal component. Let's get the horizontal component of mu n. It's this vector here. Well, we have a pair of z angles here. This angle here is the same as this, it's theta. So we multiply mu n by cos of theta. And it's pointing towards the center of the circle, so we just take the components pointing towards the center of the circle. Let's um, take the component of n. Actually, all the components are pointing towards the center of the circle. Okay, this was theta, as we saw before. So we have another z angle here. We have another pair of z angles. So we multiply the magnitude n by sine of theta to get the horizontal component of vector n. Okay, so both of these are pointing in the same direction. So when we sum these, we get the horizontal component of the resultant force. But the horizontal component of the resultant force is the resultant force itself, since it has no vertical component. Now, I forgot to mention that since the maximum friction force is acting, um, the car is going at its maximum speed. So V here is the maximum speed. So we could put in the subscript max. Intuitively, that makes sense. The faster the car goes while still um, main staying in the same circle of radius R, okay, the faster it goes, the greater the friction force. So when the friction force is a maximum, the speed of the car is a maximum. That's for a given r. We haven't changed the radius. We can also actually see that by considering the vectors. Okay, um, this vector here is FCG, force on the car due to the ground. So the ground is uh, pushing in this direction on the car. See, the wheels are turning, the wheels are pushing up the way, so the car on the ground, so by Newton's third law, the ground is pushing back on the car, as I explained before. So if you want to maximize the resultant vector f, we need to maximize this vector. Okay, so the longer this vector is, the bigger the resultant force will be. And uh, the bigger the resultant force, the bigger the speed v, because m and r are constants. We are assuming that the car is um, staying in the same circle of radius r. Now you might say, what about n? Could that be affected by increasing this? No, n is fixed. n is determined by theta and mu, and they're constants for this problem. You know, uh, we're not changing the angle of the embankment yet, and we're not changing mu, the coefficient of friction between the surfaces. We're keeping those quantities fixed for now. So by increasing FCG up to its maximum mu n, we are increasing this vector. And by increasing it, we're increasing the resultant vector f. Okay, because the resultant vector f is built up from the horizontal component of vector mu n. Um, vector n, as I said, is fixed. That contributes its horizontal component. So the bigger mu n is, sorry, the bigger fcg is, 
then the bigger F is, and in turn, the bigger the speed of the car has to be. All right, so um, so we've set FCG at its maximum, UN. Now, we can get a formula for the maximum speed in terms of mu, theta, and the radius. What's interesting here is the maximum speed does not depend on m. We can divide both sides by m. All I did here, by the way, was plug this quantity in for n on the left-hand side. Next, we multiply both sides by r and take the square root. Now, a convenient thing that we can do is divide above and below by cos of theta. So we'll get rid of these. And sine theta divided by cos theta is tan theta. So at last, we have our formula for Vmax. Let's just compare this to what we got from the previous video for the case of a car on a flat circular track. We saw that Vmax was the square root of Rg mu, or R mu g, whatever way I wrote it. Now, these formulas should agree when theta is not degrees. When theta is not degrees, we have a flat circular track. Okay, so if we plug zero into this, we should get this formula, and you can quickly verify that. The tan of zero is zero, so we get Rg mu on top, and underneath we have one minus mu times zero, well that's just one. So we do indeed get the formula for the flat circular track. Now we consider the case where the car applied the maximum force on the ground in this direction. We call it FGC. Now suppose that the car applies um, the maximum force on the ground in this direction. Okay, so this is the force on the ground due to the car. So that means that by Newton's third law, we have an equal and opposite force on the car due to the ground. So the ground is pushing up on the car. And furthermore, this is the maximum force. And we saw in the previous video that um, this force here varies from zero to mu times n. Let's suppose that FCG is at its maximum value. So, if the car is applying the maximum force on the ground, that's down in this direction, then the car must be on the verge of slipping down the embankment. Okay, so let's go and get the speed of the car in this situation. We know that since the car is going at constant or uniform speed in a circle, the resultant force points towards the centre of the circle. And we know its magnitude is given by mv squared over r. So, the car is not accelerating in the vertical direction, so the upward vertical component, the sum of the upward vertical components must equal the sum of the magnitude of the downward vertical components. So, here's the magnitudes of the upward vertical components. Or cos theta, like we saw before, this angle was theta. Now over here, we have a slightly different situation, but we have a pair of z angles here. So, we multiply mu n by sine theta to get the upward component of mu n. So there's the upward component of mu n, there's the upward component of r. We add these components together, and they must equal mg. That's the only downward component. Okay, again, like before, the reason that we can do this is because the resultant force has no vertical component. Um, it, um, the vertical component of the resultant force is zero. Now let's look at the horizontal components. The horizontal components of these vectors must add up to this vector here. They must point towards the center of the circle. Uh, the only vector that has a component pointing towards the circle is r. So we've pair of z angles, so that's the magnitude of that component is r sine theta. You could show it, I suppose. Um, let's do it in green here. There it is. And the component of mu, mu n is pointing in the opposite direction, so we would have to subtract off the horizontal component of mu n. Um, this angle in here is theta, so it's mu n cos theta. Okay, so the uh, this component, this horizontal component, the horizontal component of r minus the horizontal component of mu n must equal the resultant force mv squared over r, since vector mg has no horizontal component. By the way, I made a slip in the notation here. This is vector n, of course. Okay, so um, like before, we rearrange this to get n, and we substitute this expression in for n down here. 
we you you will find that the m's cancel so the speed is independent of the mass of the object or the car um okay you'll end up with this and you can divide above and below by cos theta like before to get this slightly more compact formula so when the car is on the verge of slipping down for this given radius r its speed is at its minimum because we will minimize the resultant force vector if we maximize this force here okay maximizing this and that's what we did this was fcg remember the force on the car due to the ground its maximum value was mu times n so by maximizing the magnitude of this vector we will um, be taking from you know the component of n we'll minimize this and minimizing the resultant force vector means we're minimizing the speed for given m and r